but I had a friend in the audience, and, and at the end of my talk, uh, I came back and sat down next to him, and he said to me, uh, well, I, I hope you enjoyed yourself. And I said, uh, oh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. And he said, good. And I said, why? He said, because they ain't ever inviting you back again. <laughs> So I'm going to say stuff today that I hope challenges the group in, in here and, and challenges you in, in a positive way, I hope, in terms of uh, the question. And the question is, what more can we do? All right, here's the end spoiler. The end spoiler is, we can do a lot more, even though we've done some pretty good stuff. Let me start by asking a question to everyone here. I had a discussion with my wife uh, the other day. And uh, she's really interested in getting a smartphone. So you know, we're trying to keep expenses down. I have two kids in college, and you know, some of you may have seen the, the Times uh, front page article yesterday about people emerging with uh, you know, $120,000 in debt and, and no job prospects and, and, and pretty bleak. And so you know, I'm always saying, well, you know, smartphone. She said, but well, you're giving a talk on, uh, uh, on uh, what is today? Uh, whatever today is. Monday, yeah. You're giving a talk on Monday. I bet the people you're talking to all have smartphones. Who here has a smartphone? Oh my God, she's right. <laughs> so here's another question. Why do you have a smartphone? Nobody wants to answer. My favorite table back there. Who has a smartphone? Charles, I'll bet you have one. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Does it make your life easier? Can you do more stuff than you could otherwise do? How do you use it? Yeah, you do more stuff. I don't know if it's all productive. Uh, how many people here their, feel their smartphone has made them a lot more productive in their work? A lot more productive. More productive. Well, how has it made you more productive? I am able to do a lot of things when I have moment to do them. I was able to buy shoes for my 89-year-old mother today on the train coming up. Seriously. I mean, okay, you, you, a lot of stuff that you couldn't do otherwise. Yep. All right. Anyone else? What does your smartphone help you do better? Yeah. Respond. Respond. Respond to what? You know, people in my office. Uh, people in your Keep in better touch. Share more information maybe. All right. Hold that thought, right? We're going to come back to it at the very end. So, I just finished this industry analysis that you can read with a microscope when you get home. <laughs> and uh, I have to admit that it was actually a, a really interesting and, and fun thing to do. Just a little bit of background. I've been involved in this field for more than uh, 30 years now. Uh, getting started actually with uh, before there was such a thing as a CDFI uh, when I was uh, really uh, pretty young involved with a, a group that was called the Institute for Community Economics which many of you may know was involved in starting what's really the, the modern day community development loan fund. The New Hampshire fund, the Boston Community Capital, TRF were all modeled after work that, that, uh, uh, that the Institute for Community Economics did with them. It's also one of the founders of the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund and have been on the board since its inception in 1983. I say this by way of saying that I'm very familiar with the operational stuff too. I've been on like every loan committee. I'm one of those people who every board I've been on, I've been the treasurer of and have looked at the numbers and crunched the numbers and all this. And, and so I'm really familiar with what are the reporting requirements, and compliance issues, and financial stuff. And so I know what a, a real pain in the butt that it is. So we just finished this industry analysis. And what we are trying to do is to say, what's going on in the field of community development financial institutions over the last five years in particular, through the recession, how did we do? What can we say about it? So the first thing we did was to try and find a lot of data, right? And of course, the first thing we found is that there's a lot of bad data or non-data. Much easier if you're a credit union or a bank because they actually have to report to their regulators on a quarterly basis. And in fact, we went and looked at all of this. So for every community development credit union, we went to the call reports, we compiled 
uh, the quarterly reports, we did it systematically. We did it for every single one of them for five years, and we looked at those data. We did the same thing for community development banks, and then we got to community development loan funds, and we started pulling our hair out, right? Because there aren't great data. Yeah, there's the SIS data and all that, but after looking at it for about two and a half minutes, we discovered it was really not very good. So we're trying to convince the CDFI fund that if they really wanted us to do a good analysis of the data, we actually needed some data. And as it turns out, they probably have the best data. So after going back and forth with their lawyers for uh, what seemed like an eternity, uh, the CDFI fund finally agreed to give us, with names redacted, to give us all the applications they received the last five years from those CDFI loan funds that were both funded and not funded. And as you know, if you're a, a loan fund, you have to submit your financial data for several years with your application. We took all of, took all of those data and created our own database so that we had what we think is really the best data on CDFI loan funds that goes from everyone who applied from 2005 through 2010. And we looked at all sorts of questions for all these CDFI types. What sort of capitalization and liquidity issues did they face? What was their portfolio health? Uh, what risk management issues did they have? Did they actually have any risk management systems in place? What did they look like? What factors affected CDFI self-sufficiency? How were they affected by the recession? Uh, what were the different uh, types, sizes, financial products? Uh, so pretty comprehensive, we looked at all of these data. Uh, we looked at the financial reports, uh, we looked at uh, data from uh, 80 CDFI senior executives who surveyed in 2011, uh, we looked at the SIS data, we did interviews with 13 industry stakeholders, by industry stakeholders we mean, for example, the heads of the, uh, of the different uh, 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 of the, uh, for example, Mark Pinsky of OFN, the trade associations, Cliff. Uh, we talked to a whole range of people. And so this report really uh, summarizes our, our key findings. So you're probably wondering how we do. Well, the answer is that uh, actually CDFIs did pretty well. Uh, what were some of our key findings? Well, CDFIs have been stepping into the breach. Uh, and during the recession, actually, CDFIs increased lending while banks were decreasing lending. We were able to verify and document this. The CDFI portfolio performance during this time was pretty good. When I say pretty good, yes, delinquencies and defaults went up a little bit, but in general, if you look across the industry, uh, very few institutions were put out of business. Most of them had reserved very well against it. And most CDFIs survived and did a lot better than comparable banks and non-CDFI credit unions that we compared them to. All right, now we're getting into some of the more controversial parts, though. What else did we find? Well, our analysis suggests that the story we tell about CDFIs is largely correct. Lending increased, deployment rates during the recession increased, uh, delinquencies and defaults increased slightly, uh, but then declined again starting in 2009 throughout the industry. Uh, so by and large, CDFIs did what they were supposed to. Uh, the story we often tell is that CDFIs are institutions that have learned to effectively manage risk that discourages conventional financial institutions from lending to the individuals and communities that we lend to, and that they've served these communities fairly well. They succeeded in lending while maintaining loan performance standards generally equivalent or better than the conventional financial sector. So that is the good news. However, and this isn't necessarily the bad news, but this is the other news. However, it's also true that the costs of serving these individuals and communities is somewhat higher and good performance is in part somewhat due to the fact that the additional technical and training services provided by CDFIs add cost. So CDFIs, a couple of findings. They did step into the breach. 
Portfolio performance has been mixed, but generally pretty good. But there are significant scale effects exist in, in, in all sectors of the CDFI industry. What do we mean by significant scale factors? By significant scale factors, we mean that bigger CDFIs do better. Bigger CDFIs generally have higher deployment rates. They generally have better leverage on their balance sheet. They generally have lower levels of charge-offs as organizations progress from a million dollars in assets up. And there are probably pretty good reasons for this. Now let me stop for a second and say, all right, he hates small CDFIs. Now, Tristram, you'll remember this too. In, in Washington, I gave the warning. I, I had a, a pre-trial, a trial run on this about a month ago before the fund allowed us to release it. And I said, I'm going to tell the findings, but before I do, and before we have questions or comments or anything like that, I want to say here and now that I don't dislike small CDFIs. In fact, I really like small CDFIs. But <laughs> they have to change, I think, the way they're doing business. And in fact, organizations like this coalition could be the venue through which that change occurs. Now, you'll remember, Tristan, too, that the first question I got after I made that warning in Washington, I said, I don't, I said, I, I don't think small CDFI should be gotten rid of. No, you see, the solution is not that. In fact, what I'm going to suggest is that small CDFIs and large CDFIs need to create an operating network that includes all of them. And in fact, this is something where I think you ought to go after the state of New York. That is, if you have a joint project, one of our recommendations, as you'll see to the CDFI fund, was create an infrastructure fund. That is, create money to help CDFIs, particularly smaller ones, build operating platforms so you spend more time with your customers and less time doing the stuff that you don't need to be doing yourself. What does that mean? Well, what we found with small CDFIs when we looked further, oh, by the way, the first question when I was done, even though with that warning, you're not going to do it, I'm sure this audience won't do it, was, question, yes, why do you hate small CDFIs and want to get rid of all of this? So remember, I don't hate small CDFIs and I don't want to get rid of any of them. Not a single one in this room, not one of them, I don't want to get rid of, I don't want to get rid of any of them. So if anyone's first question is, why do you hate small CDFIs, and I'm looking at you, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what I'll do, but it'll be terrible. What did we find? What we found was that CDFIs tend to still be these institutions that are vertically integrated. Uh, by vertically integrated, what I mean is that they all need to feel like they need to do everything themselves. So if you're a CDFI, you do your own loan origination, you do your own servicing, your own technical assistance, your own Clients, your own everything. And in some ways, what we found was that even though CDFIs say, we're really good at collaboration, see, we belong to this network, what we found is that CDFIs are terrible at collaboration. In fact, they very, they hardly ever collaborate. What we see is good examples. We have in the room couple people from Oxion. Oxion is actually a really good example of creating a networked organization where they say, we're going to have the field offices do the things that they do really well, but we're going to centralize some of the things that they don't do that well and don't need to do at all and that we can do better. So in many ways, Oxion is a good model. We have another good model. I don't know if they're here. Is Fahi here? Someone from Fahi was supposed to be here. Yes, Eric, not here yet. Not here yet. Fi is another interesting example, uh, uh, which we've talked about in terms of networks. But by and large, CDFIs have tended to be these relatively small, vertically integrated organizations that don't derive all the benefit they can and serve the number of customers they can because they spend too much time doing stuff that they don't need to do and not enough time doing the stuff which is interacting with the customers, driving more performance, because in the end, if the goal is about achieving impact, 
And the way we achieve impact is by growing so we serve more people. So the more people have access to financial services and more people have access to financial products if they need them. So what we really found is that the CDFI industry, we looked at 900 CDFIs. The bad news is that, you know, in, in the conference, you'll remember this too in Washington, that the fund got up and said, we're doing great because there are now, they say a thousand, when we looked, there were like 940, so they, they grow really fast. There are now a thousand CDFIs, as if that's supposed to be a measure of success. It's not. All that tells us is there are a thousand CDFIs. It doesn't tell us if they've done anything. Here's the part that we don't want to talk a lot about. Of the some thousand CDFIs, many of them are extremely marginal operations. They have money, it often sits there. They have low deployment rates. They don't make very many loans. They spend most of the money that they do have on administering the loans and servicing their very small portfolios. This isn't good for the industry. Yes, we have some very high performing ones, but the challenge that we have is how do we make all CDFIs high performing ones? So we looked at hundreds of CDFIs, many of them marginal. Now remember, I'm not saying we should get rid of them. What we need to do is make them more powerful organizations. All right, so let's think of a story here. What would a more powerful organization look like? All right, everybody close your eyes. No, don't close your eyes. Keep your eyes open, but think about this scenario. We'll pick on someone randomly. Charles Hamlin, we'll pick, pick on him. Where are you, Charles? Charlie, okay. So Charles Hamlin wakes up one morning, rubs the sleep from his eyes, takes a shower, and starts trudging in in his long commute to work. How long is that commute? 12 minutes. <laughs> 12 minutes. Like I said, his long 12 minute commute to work. And during this 12 minutes, he starts thinking, oh no, what bad news is there gonna be this time when I open up my computer and start checking my email? Gets into the office, says hello to all his colleagues. How many are there? Oh, one person office. No. Opens his computer and finds out there are actually a number of emergencies. One of his potential borrowers needs a loan, but needs more than what Charles has at this time. Charles has been asked also to participate in a new market tax credit deal. He's really not familiar with how those work very well. He's trying to attract some secondary lenders so he can sell some of the own mortgage loans that he's made. He actually has a lot of problems. And what he's thinking to myself is, boy, you know, it would be great to be part of a network or an organization that could do this stuff for me. And so he starts dreaming. He closes his eyes, puts the computer down for a minute, and says, what would it look like if I was part of a network where the following things happened? My expenses were cut because I didn't have to do all the loan servicing. There was someone who did it better. That if I hired another person, it could be a person who could meet with borrowers and help bring deals to the table. Oh, wait, on my online platform here on the left-hand side, on the menu, there's a training and education button. I can click it. Oh, I can go to new market tax credits. Oh, look, there's an online course specifically for me to take, taught by an expert in the field, available to me any time I want it, for $25. That's what I'm paying. Oh, and uh, I need a participation. I'm going to go to the participation link on the left-hand side of my computer screen. I click on participation. Hey, look, there are four other CDFIs in New York that can participate with me on this multifamily housing deal. Oh, look, all the documentation is already done on the documentation link. I just have to click on documentation because for four or five different kinds of loans, we've standardized our documentation for charter schools, multifamily housing, small business loans, 
all reviewed by good New York lawyers, all ready to use when we need it. Oh, look, the state of New York has finally, because we've come to them with a comprehensive plan, funded a secondary market to buy these loans because we're all cooperating now. It's a dream, Charles. It's a dream come true, except it hasn't come true yet. And I think that's where, we, where it comes into play. How do we get out of the mindset of being individual CDFIs where we think every day about how are we going to originate these loans, who's going to service them, who's going to collect it when the payment isn't on time, where do I go to get good information, where, how can I provide more leverage on state agencies to do stuff so that they actually show up at my conferences when I invite them, no offense intended. But it's frustrating, isn't it? Because we know we could do good work, but we're not structured in a way where we can do our best work. Let me end by telling you a story that I think about a lot in terms of change, and then get back to why I think the smartphone analogy is important. I had a student a number of years ago who worked for the Department of Agriculture in Maine. And as his final student project, it's a program similar to the, the one I run now, where it's a low residency. You do a project in your own community, usually at your own workplace. He had done it with the Maine Department of Agriculture, where he worked. And what they had found was that, this was right after the passage of NAFTA, was that um, the sale of potatoes was declining in Maine, and it was really affecting a lot of the farmers negatively. And it was affecting them negatively because essentially, Potatoes from across the border in Canada, in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, were cheaper and generally thought to be of higher quality. And so when the borders opened, Canadian potatoes came across the border and sales of Maine potatoes declined and farmers started losing money. And the Department of Agriculture came up with a plan. This is the plan that, that my student came up with. And that plan was to look at what were the alternatives to growing potatoes. And so they did soil tests and they did market analysis and what they found was that the market was changing anyhow. That people were starting to eat fewer potatoes because generally they weren't seen as a great food. They were high in carbs even though the industry pushes it as a healthy food. And by and large a lot of people were thinking it wasn't that healthy. And the soil test came back with the idea that broccoli was good that is cool weather, broccoli's grown in cool weather in the type of soil they had in northern Maine. And in fact, market analysis showed that this was a healthy food and consumer demand for broccoli was increasing. And in fact, they're saying, particularly in the Boston market where people eat their vegetables or something like that, I don't know. But they were finding that, in fact, the demand was increasing. And so they were holding a workshop and he invited me to come. This is sort of. <coughs> end of his, present, uh, of his uh, project, and it was a presentation, and they had invited a number of farmers. So I was driving up, I was a few minutes late, I snuck into the back of the room, sat next to a guy, the guy was obviously a, uh, a farmer, uh, I knew that I can recognize that my father grew up on a farm in the Midwest, and every summer I was sent out to the farm for about a month because it was my parents thought it would build my character to work on the farm for about a month with my Uncle Morris. I, I disagreed with them and I lost that argument every year. Uh, and I sat in the back of the room and uh, they actually he did a really great presentation. Not that I'm surprised, but he did a great presentation. This was pre-PowerPoint still, the early 90s. And, but they had these really nice charts, you know, the chart with, uh, uh, you know, potatoes and an arrow going down and broccoli with an arrow going up. and, and uh, and uh, I thought it was, you know, pretty convincing presentation. I, I thought, you know, A work, you know, really good. And, uh, and the presentation ends and they say, uh, you know, are there any questions? And it's that, you know, terribly awkward moment that everybody knows. And, you know, if you've given any questions and like everybody's looking down. And, and uh, you know, there, there aren't many questions. And I, so I turned to the guy next to me. And I said, so what do you think? And he said, uh, you know what I'd do if I won a million dollars in the lottery? And I thought, well, 
he'd obviously zoned out, and probably the luncheon speakers and like that. He probably zoned out, but you know, I, I was raised in the Midwest, and I was taught that being polite is more important than anything, so you know, I went along with it and said, uh, well, you know, no. What would you do if you won a million dollars in the lottery? And he said, I'd keep growing potatoes until I ran out of money. <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of here. We'll keep growing potatoes until we run out of money. Because we figured out how to do something well on one level, which is to how to serve borrowers who otherwise aren't served by the mainstream financial institutions. But we haven't figured out how to do it in a way that achieves maximum impact. So what we need to do is think about how do we create real networks, real collaborations, where when I described when Charles comes into his office, it's not that far away. In doing our research, we found a fascinating group, a cooperative of very small mortgage lenders based in St. Louis, but with, off, but with independent lenders, it's called Lenders One, all over the country, 235 of them, compared to how many CDFIs, they originated over $10 billion in mortgages two years ago. They performed very well. They weren't these subprime lenders. And they actually have this operating platform that does all of that. You have to purchase insurance, click, Need documentation? Click. Secondary market? Click. An extremely profitable, cooperatively owned, for-profit corporation. They're doing it now. They're doing it now because they make more money that way. We can do that too. Creating an online platform like that is not that difficult. The hardest part of it is getting the agreement of the people who would own it to agree to do it. Yes, cost is a factor. The upfront cost isn't insignificant. But the technology is there, right? So how many people own smartphone? smartphones? Right? Good. Why? Because it makes your life easier and you can be more efficient. It doesn't make you a less socially responsible person or anything else. It makes you able to do your work better. So that's my challenge to a group like this. Can you form a network so that you actually operate as a network, not as a bunch of individual <coughs> players? Can you harness the technology because it will make you more efficient and have greater impact and serve more of your customers? Can you convince the state that funding infrastructure, and like I said, our number one recommendation out of this, you'll see it to the CDFI fund, is fund infrastructure. Provide incentives for CDFIs to collaborate because most of the funding that you give goes to organizations that don't use it as well as they could. We know that from our study. So that's what I'm saying. Let's grow some broccoli here. Thank you. Michael is buy her the smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> buy her the smartphone. Okay. So, um, so we do have uh, time for questions. 